All right, here we go. Hi, I'm Diane McGarry with Drake at Arts. With me today are co-host Tom McGarry, Dr. Kelly McMillan, and ASL interpreter Connie. Dr. McMillan graduated from the Dartmouth Medical School in 1993. She specializes in obstetrics and gynecology and is affiliated with St. Joseph's Hospital in Nashua. Today's discussion was spurred by November Arts Saturday author, Judith Dickerman Nilsson, and her memoir, Believe in Me, A Teenage Mom's Story, where she talks about finding herself pregnant as a high school student. Our goal is to discuss what someone who doesn't expect to become pregnant can do. What are the resources and support that a pregnant person needs? So let's start right there. Kelly, what health things do pregnant people need? Pregnant people need both health and emotional health uh, supervision. Uh, the majority of these women are scared. Uh, their pregnancies are not necessarily planned. And they may initially not even know what to do when they're you know, first coming out as far as saying that they're pregnant. Some of them have not even disclosed this to family members. You may be the first person that knows of this uh, you know, announcement or diagnosis. So the first thing that uh, we need to establish is in each individual, what is the situation that they are in? Are they going to be uh, supported? Is this something that's welcome? 20% uh, of teens that become preg pregnant uh, are not using birth control. And when you ask them if they have any problems with being pregnant, 20% of them say that they have no problem with this. So it's not that they are upset by this. Um, and it depends on what the family situation is, if they have that support. So how soon do they need to go for medical care? I would think that if someone has a positive pregnancy test, establishing care as soon as you know is important. Some of these young women become pregnant and they have no idea of how long they've been pregnant. Oh, there could be exposures to things along the way that they did not even realize that they were pregnant. So establishing early on the quote due date is very important. So what is prenatal care? Prenatal care is a way for us to use uh, time to assess um, the medical and psychological needs of these uh, pregnant people. Uh, we need to be able to evaluate them over the course of the pregnancy, which may be nine months. It may only be three months, depending on how far along someone is. If they come in and they're already seven months pregnant and they did not know, we have all that time we need to catch up on wow. educating them. And, and making sure that they know what to expect going forward. Because not everybody's periods are regular either, right? So it's very easy for someone to slip through the cracks. Exactly. So initially when we uh, meet with um, someone, we hope that there's someone there with them to provide support. We generally do a full physical uh, history, uh, discuss medical history and family history as how it may pertain to them during pregnancy and also use it as a, as a sort of a launch pad for sort of discussing health in general, because there were things that happened during pregnancy that may continue beyond the pregnancy uh, that require ongoing, you know, care. So what are some of those issues that might come up? Uh, there can be uh, things like diabetes. Uh, there can be a higher chance of developing hypertension towards the end of pregnancy, even in someone who is young. Uh, there may be undiagnosed mental illness uh, that may be exacerbated by pregnancy. So when we think about pregnant people, it is there were some conditions that may develop in pregnancy. There may be some that get worse during pregnancy. And if women are only coming to the doctor for pregnancy and birth control, we may be the only providers that they see. Yeah. And this tends to go on through many years, through the re reproductive years. So one of the things I know from my own pregnancies was getting um, vitamins and also being told things to avoid, like avoiding alcohol and drugs. Is rehab available? And how do these things affect the pregnancy and the, and the bathing and the birthing outcome? So there are some 
uh, facilities that are available that provide counseling and rehab. And they, there's um, a facility in Nashua uh, called Keystone Hall. The, they don't tend to take adolescents, but they do have services available for um, pregnant people who uh, are planning on having their baby and being able to stay there after the delivery for ongoing care. Otherwise, there are uh, counseling facilities. Uh, as far as substance abuse in the very young teens, um, I don't think that we've had, at least in our experience in Nashua, um, the degree of needing rehab as we do in some of the women that are in their 20s and 30s. Uh, but I will say that there is the Vaping tends to be the big one, not so much cigarettes and alcohol, but definitely vaping. And we try to use the pregnancy as a way to encourage someone to uh, avoid all substances and make healthy choices. So, so vaping is really not good for you. No. And it's the things that substances can potentially do is it can increase the risk of you having a baby that's uh, smaller than it's supposed to be. Uh, it can increase the, there's been an association uh, with delivering prematurely and teens in general do have a higher chance of having a preterm delivery. Uh, you know, their bodies sometimes, despite being able to conceive, some of these young women are, their bodies are not developed for delivering a baby that, you know, would go to term. So what do you mean their body isn't developed? They're not ready to give birth? There's a... Hey, there are some um, women that are very small. The pelvis can be somewhat small. If you're 14 or 15 versus someone who is 21, all of the hormonal adaptations in pregnancy allow for your joints to soften to allow the passage of a fetus. But there are times where the young girl is just, you know, still very small. And I think... You know, there. when we look at modes of delivery, um, the C-section rate is not higher, uh, but we have noticed that there, there can be a higher incidence of needing to do uh, an operative vaginal delivery, be it forceps or a vacuum, because some of it is these um, young women may be scared or they may be sort of on the smaller side. I mean, it's, I'm sure it's, it's I think, quite... Uh, intimidating to try to give birth the uh, first time at any age. But I think that uh, at age 14 or 15, that's probably even more daunting. Yeah. I mean, I really enjoyed my pregnancies and the experience, but I was also 40 years old. So it's a whole different so, perspective. Yes. Yeah. I yeah. think that the, um, the wanting, you know, a planned pregnancy with a supportive partner um, bodes much better than for um, someone who is extremely young. And some of these um, people, you know, there are times where there's a lot of other extraneous factors, boy, you know, father of the baby, involved, not involved, may also have someone else pregnant at the same time. There's just a lot of drama that can happen. And I think that some of these young patients, um, sometimes I think that they conceive somewhat intentionally. They would love to have a baby for some unconditional love. Mm -hmm. And they hope that the boyfriend or the father of the baby will be around. And, and sometimes that's, that's not the case. And this is a time where they need to, to learn how to be able to cope with that lack of support and rely on the support of others. Yeah. In Judith's book, her boyfriend initially was going to be around and then his family said, no way, we won't support you, we'll kick you out. So that this type of drama comes up and that causes a lot of stress, not only on the, the boy who's the father, but also on the young woman who's carrying the child. You know, yes. I mean, she ultimately decided to go ahead on her own, but she went on her own unsupported by anyone. And that, yes, uh, that's hard. <laughs> As far as stress is concerned, I often will have patients ask me about how much can stress impact my pregnancy? Is this going to cause something bad to happen? And I think that it's, um, it's sort of a, a way to try and teach them 
how to deal with stress, um, be it biofeedback, counseling, stress reduction techniques, uh, but also, you know, realizing that this is going to be the first of many stressors, uh, you know, considering you're a teen and you're going to be taking care of a newborn and there may or may not be someone there to help you. And there are many times where the grandparents of the newborn are very involved because sometimes there is this cycle of if someone's had a baby at a young age, their daughter goes on to have another baby. So it's almost this cycle where these young, these grandparents are only in their thirties or forties and they can be quite helpful. It's almost like their second chance to, you know, raise a family. Yeah. So that actually gets into postnatal care. And what is that and why is that important? Uh, postnatal care is important uh, for multiple reasons. One is to address ongoing uh, medical uh, concerns that may have come up during the pregnancy, uh, be it sometimes there can be hypertension, diabetes, big time to be evaluating for postpartum depression or mental illness. So what's postpartum depression? Postpartum, of course, my dog is... Postpartum depression is when there is the development of a mood disorder within the first few weeks of pregnancy up until one year of age. And I'm sorry. No, no, that's all right. So you're saying a mood disorder. I'm not sure what that means. It could be depression. It could be manifest as mania. So the opposite of depression. There are some women uh, that will initially uh, seem withdrawn, depressed, uh, but there are rare times where someone can develop uh, a bipolar exacerbation and become manic. Um, very rarely they're psychosis. Um, but these are times where, you know, you need to be, uh, you know, checking for those things. And the other big part of this is to, to discuss contraception. So I think there's approximately 20 to 25% of these women will have another baby within two years. Oh, well, so. And that's a needing, big call on your body to do that. Yes. So one of the things that can happen, if you think about carrying a pregnancy and then having another pregnancy, you know, soon thereafter, the toll that it takes on your body is, you know, your, your blood system, your bone marrow, your, you become potentially anemic, uh, exhausted because your body has just supported a nine month pregnancy. And the fetus is pretty much like a parasite. It will take everything that you, you have. And then to turn around and, and have it, you know, again is, you know, it can take its toll. Plus the breastfeeding too, right? If you choose to breastfeed, you're still giving the resources to the baby. So yes, we could talk a little bit um, more about possible complications because people think that all pregnancies are easy and uneventful, but that's not really true, is it? No, it's not. And I think that um, in the last few years with COVID, uh, COVID has made things a little more complicated than they previously were. In the past, we would generally be concerned about diabetes, preterm delivery, um, but COVID-19 has only amplified that, increased preterm delivery risk, increased the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. So it's, uh, it's just one more layer of adding complexity to a, a potentially otherwise uh, healthy time in someone's life. Uh, I think a lot of people assume that if you're healthy enough to get pregnant, you should be healthy, but your body is not the same. Your immune system is not the same. And any illness could potentially be more detrimental than if you were not pregnant. So can you actually be too young to successfully bring a baby to term? without long-term health effects? Yes, I think that um, the majority of 
uh, teens that become pregnant, I think there's greater than 65% chance of, you know, success rate with, uh, you know, carrying a, a pregnancy to term. Uh, there, there is a, you know, no chance, no difference in uh, miscarriage rate. So if we're looking at, of all these young women who uh, conceive, the miscarriage rate is about 15%, which is consistent with most age groups. Uh, approximately, I think a quarter tend to um, not continue the pregnancy. And the remainder, you know, 60 to 70% will go on to have a healthy term pregnancy. Mm -hmm. But that also can be deceptive in a way when we talk about miscarriages, because for instance, I was talking with my daughter, uh, my sister-in-law over the summer, and I knew that she'd miscarried in her early 20s, but she said when she looked at her health records, she was surprised to see that it was listed as an abortion. She did not know that that term was there. So what is the difference and the usage of these two terms? Unfortunately, uh, there's medical terminology uh, and with electronic medical records, there it's, it's similar to if you're in the computer and you're trying to look something up. If you're even off by one letter, it's difficult to find something you're searching for. Oh, gosh. With medical, you know, the medical diagnosis of a miscarriage is a spontaneous abortion, but it does show up as a, in, a, in a medical terminology as an abortion. So there's a spontaneous abortion as a miscarriage. Uh, an incomplete abortion would be if someone had become pregnant and they were bleeding, but their body hadn't completely recognized that something was wrong and they did not completely pass all of the tissue. And if there were a fetus, it didn't pass the, the fetus. There's another condition where it's called a missed miscarriage or a missed abortion. And that means that you're technically pregnant and the baby started to develop or the fetus started to develop, but there was no heartbeat. So all of these things are termed some form of an abortion, but it's not an elective abortion. And I think that it's awful when someone has had a pregnancy loss, especially if it's a much wanted pregnancy, to then see that word abortion show up in their medical record or in a billing statement because they sought medical attention. It's a slap in the face and it's awful. It, it also has legal ramifications now too, doesn't it? I mean, because I mean, in my daughter, my sister-in-law's case, the fetus had died and she needed a DNC. So, um, which is one of the cases you're talking about, but yes, the baby was wanted, but, it, and then we actually need to define what fetus and baby mean, because those are two different terms that we tend to use interchangeably, but they're very different and they have very different emotional ramifications for people. Yeah, so up until about eight weeks, uh, from the last menstrual period, we, we tend to say, is that the embryonic or the embryo stage? And then from that point onward to delivery is, you know, the technical term would generally be called the fetus. And once the fetus is born, uh, it's considered the baby. But I think in most the lay population, most people will say, you know, this is my baby. And they, I don't know how often the, the general population would refer to this being that's growing inside them as the fetus. So, but there are lots of complications that can happen, right? So, in a way, it's it's a good protectivism for ourselves to be able to discern that there's a, a very clear difference because fetuses, um, well, we're getting better, so we can life support further into younger weeks, but they're really not quality live on their own they're not viable on their own correct in the past uh in european countries 28 weeks or seven months out of a 10-month pregnancy was felt to be what the europeans would call uh, a miscarriage so in, in the united states uh anything prior to 20 weeks gestation or what we would call approximately five months is considered a miscarriage uh, in europe 
they used to extend that up to about 27 weeks. Wow. So once you start the third trimester, if you lost a pregnancy at 25 weeks, it would be considered a miscarriage. Uh, but in the U.S., anything before 20 weeks is considered a miscarriage. And anything beyond 20 weeks would be called a fetal demise. So, so this isn't really the, the mother causing the fetus to leave her body in any way. This is something that regularly happens to people. People just have miscarriages. Correct. And the majority of times, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think that human nature is that there's always the question of what did I do or not do that made this happen? Did I not take my vitamins? Did I do too much exercise? Did I not keep my appointments? But I always... In any situation, I try to uh, encourage the patient, no matter what they're doing, try to do some, you know, make, give them some positive feedback, um, but to always say there's nothing that you could have done uh, to prevent this. The guilt of itself, um, I think that if, if it's a, uh, a young teen uh, and is losing a pregnancy, uh, they may not be in the best situation even prior to conceiving. And this is something that they become pregnant. I'm healthy enough to become pregnant. I'm normal. And then to lose a pregnancy, there's this, my body has failed me. Mm. And I think that that can be a, a, just one more uh, setback um, or blow to the confidence. I actually experienced that and I was 41. So it wasn't that I was a young, inexperienced person. I already had one child, but it's like, can I have another baby? Will it happen again? And it's a very vulnerable it's just a vulnerable place to be and mm-hmm. we as a society don't talk about this very much people don't share their stories which is why i'm very clear to say right here and now yeah. that i'm one of those women that this happened to and you know it, it's a very difficult it's just hard and and right it's like i must have done something wrong but i know i didn't because i have good yeah. OBGYNs who help support me through that but it's just It's devastating. It can be very devastating on many levels. I think that one of the most difficult things when I'm meeting with um, a teen is trying to get an idea of where they're at with the pregnancy. Um, Are they excited? I mean, it's it's normal to be scared. Um, There's always this, I should be excited. And, you know, the, the, what, you know, how do you want to proceed from here? Uh, there are many options, um, but I think that these young people are impressionable. They sometimes rely on um, what their friends say. Um, I've had situations where I've had a, a young patient who, whose friends all said, you know, gave the advice of you should have a, a termination. And mm-hmm. when the young woman chose to give the baby for adoption, the friend said, how could you do that? So it's, it's very interesting how the young mind works and, and how these people sort of rely on feedback or to get, you know, to their getting advice and support. Sure. So you just brought up actually two alternatives people can do and have when they're pregnant. They can see it through, they can give the baby up for adoption, they can keep it themselves, and, or they can terminate the pregnancy. Yes. Very, very, you know, difficult discussions to have. And um, I think that uh, making sure that patients know that every option is available and that they will not be treated differently or looked down upon because they choose to do something that someone else may not approve of. Yeah. So. We talked about miscarriages and what they are. There's also something called stillbirth. What is that? And can that be avoided? So a stillbirth is any time after the fifth month, uh, up until time of delivery, at which point the baby dies. And it's obviously extremely traumatic. Um, And In the majority of situations, there's not a cause that's been identified. The things that we tend to think about with a stillbirth is um, 
severe hypertension, uh, sometimes a fall or, or abuse or trauma, anything that would potentially impact the placenta uh, because the placenta is the lifeline between the mom and the baby. So something that damages or sickens the placenta and causes it to not function as well would potentially cause a, you know, a fetus to, to die. Uh, we talk about a, a cord accident tends to be the number one thing people think of is the cord must have been around the neck and it basically strangulated the baby and cut off the oxygen supply. But anything that cuts off the oxygen supply is potentially a factor. So high blood pressure, diabetes, infection. So there's long-term health of effects can be caused by a pregnancy and by a person's choices, right? And, and even like you talked about heart disease and diabetes, high blood pressure, the stress, there are also autoimmune diseases or cancer or um, mm -hmm. medically needed medications, all that can affect the pregnancy or be long-term effects of the pregnancy for the pregnant woman themselves. Yes, absolutely. So how does that affect people's pregnancy choices, whether they, um, choose to have the baby or not could because like if you're receiving chemo that could potentially be an issue so the some of the medical conditions that teens have um diabetes uh thyroid disorders there were times when if you are a, a young teen with a long-standing medical a chronic chronic medical illness um Sometimes they may have a higher intended pregnancy rate because they've been sick their entire life and they've played into that. That's, you know, who they are and they become pregnant. And that means I'm healthy enough to be pregnant. I'm just like everyone else. So there may be times where a teen may actually desire to be pregnant just to sort of be in the I, I'm actually somewhat, you know, normal, which is kind of heart wrenching and thinking, you know, you should probably care for yourself medically and then plan for a pregnancy. But it's not unusual to have, you know, someone very young who is a brittle diabetic who's not using birth control and becomes pregnant. Wow. And I don't think that the majority of those situations are that there's going to be a, a choice to uh, terminate a pregnancy. I think part of it is they think, well, I'm, I'm sickly now. As we age, we tend to become sicker. So this may be my one choice, my one chance. So. So where can people go for help with their pregnancy choices? I think that the, um, if a young woman is uh, pregnant, Typically, uh, the avenue would be first being, you know, uh, discovered at a pediatrician's office or uh, potentially a, a Planned Parenthood. Um, sometimes these um, young women will be looking for contraceptive services, and they they're wanting that confidentiality. And sometimes going to their family doctor or their pediatrician um, it may be, you know too much for them to handle. And I think that nowadays people are much more open um, or they seem to, they say that they are um, as far as trying to have that open communication uh, and saying, you know, you need, you can tell me anything. And if you need birth control, we'll get you to the doctor or the midwife. Um, but there are still some, I think that would go to uh, clinics, downtown clinics, um, Planned Parenthood, and basically a pregnancy test is pretty much one of the first tests that uh, any provider would do in almost any situation if someone is you know, old enough to become pregnant. Uh, you know, someone comes in with a viral illness or some sort of sickness, it's not necessarily someone walking in the door with pregnancy symptoms. And once that pregnancy test is positive, there needs to be the, well, maybe you should make a, an appointment to see an obstetrician gynecologist where it can be discussed. How do you feel about this? These are some of your options. Have you thought about anything, uh, anything else? And it's, it's sometimes a difficult discussion to have 
Um, because if you're 15 and, and pregnant, um, most people aren't planning to become pregnant at say 15. And I don't think most people would encourage it, but you need to know that that young person may be very committed to continuing the pregnancy. So you need to embrace it with them. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing this valuable information with us, Kelly. And we appreciate it and hope that others find it informative and helpful as well. To support our programs, please consider giving a donation through our website, drakeatarts.com, where you can also find more information about our upcoming Arts Saturdays. And thank you to our current sponsors and donors, Helen Fremont, Marianne Dornice Goldman, Lois Welber, Blue Shutter Web Design, Diane Song, the Massachusetts Cultural Council grants as administered by the Bill Ricca and Drakeit Cultural Councils, and Anonymous. Thank you. Thank you.